Thanks everyone for, for coming along. I guess to start off with, it would be great to hear a little bit more about both of you and about your businesses and why you decided to start building them and to take this SaaS-enabled market approach. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Hanno. I, I started Eversports uh, some five years ago. Uh, the principal idea was to build only a marketplace for sport activities um, focused on ball sports in Austria back then. Uh, we realized very early on that uh, the business model doesn't work uh, for us because the inventory for us were free tennis courts, free soccer courts, and in order to know about the inventory, you have to know the schedule of the venue. And um, yeah, we thought that we will have APIs to the software that the venue uses, and early on we had to realize that uh, most of the venues were still not using anything. So. So um, yeah, um, we had to we had to change our uh, game plan and and become a, a SaaS company first, and um, yeah, we started uh, selling the software to ball sport venues and very early on um, uh, started also to monetize the marketplace on top of it. So SaaS enabled marketplace was then the, the strategy we went into, and uh, two years, two three years in the in the in the game or in our history, we realized that ball sports is also not uh, the easiest uh, industry because the venue owners are quite old and uh, not very digital and sales cycles are long. And then we shifted into boutique fitness and um, there we realized that, uh, that the crowd really likes the product. And um, yeah, so s skipping the five years where we are currently now, uh, we are selling the software to boutique studios, so yoga, Zumba, Pilates, CrossFit. And uh, we still do the ball sports, but only on the passive side. So if people ask us for it, we, we sell it to them. And lately, we also entered the fitness market only on the marketplace. So right now, we quite understand quite well uh, the difference between only having a marketplace layer versus having SaaS, uh, a SaaS layer uh, underneath the marketplace. Hi, I'm Stefan. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for 19 years now. Um, I started my career as software developer. So uh, my first company was just a software development house. We built custom software um, for telcos, banks, and insurance companies. Um, back in 2011, I launched iTaxi, which is a taxi hailing app um, that operates in Poland. And um, it was when I realized how powerful mar marketplaces are and how powerful network effects are uh, and how important it is to get to that liquidity and tipping point and how it solves everything or almost everything. So um, we started Booksy um, about four years ago. Actually, we started it as a light, white label solution for classified media companies, but they didn't believe um, into the product. and. Um, uh, the model didn't want to buy it, so we decided to brand it ourselves, and we launched it in the US and in Poland um, at the beginning of 2015. It took us about, it took us a few months to find product to market fit. We initially launched it as a marketplace. Actually, that was supposed to be classified 2.0. We just added that book button to the listing, and that was the initial idea behind Booksy. We just wanted to, to give added value, and we built it as a mobile-first platform. Uh, but after two months of running that in Miami with our first partner, um, the Flyer, um, we uh, learned that building a marketplace in this space is extremely difficult. And that's because, as Hanno said, like, you need to know the inventory. You need to know their availability. And we also found out that most of them are still um, using pen and paper. So it was virtually impossible um, to provide good quality inventory to our consumers. And also, in this space, 60 to 80% of appointments come from repeat clients. So um, uh, service providers, merchants, they um, they rather take their existing clients, if they have conflicts or double bookings, they take care of their existing clients because they don't want to upset them, uh, and they don't pay commission for them. So it's a no-brainer, like, if they have a client brought by a marketplace, they have to pay commission for, and then they have to ditch their loyal client, they would rather take care of their loyal client. So two months after running a marketplace, we realized that this is a no-go, so we pivoted uh, the business model to to SaaS, um, even though the product was pretty much the same, because 
from the very beginning we knew we didn't want to integrate with hundreds of different players. It would be a lot of hassle and it would be virtually impossible. So we knew we, we wanted to um, replace them. Um, and about 12 months ago, we started um, adding that marketplace component to our SaaS um, business. Um, and it's been growing pretty nice since then. So uh, we are excited now. Uh, we've proven the business model of, of, of the SaaS enabled marketplace, and we are now rolling that out across more markets and um, cities across um, our core markets. Great. And, and just building on, on what you both said, what would you say are really the top three advantages of taking this SaaS enabled marketplace approach? as opposed to just doing a normal, pure transactional marketplace? Um, yeah, from my perspective, I think uh, starting with the software, um, using a quote from, from what I've read from OpenTable that we use uh, ourselves as well is, uh, you can tell the story, come for the software, stay for the network. So people buy into the software, you deliver them value from, from, from the first moment they do a deal with you, you ease in their work. Um, especially if they were not digital before, they start to see how much time they can save by using software. And uh, we also started giving them a white label solution for their websites, so they had a widget from day, on, uh, from day one, so they also received online bookings from day one. So um, when we started, uh, the, the widget bookings were like 90% of the bookings. Mm -hmm. And what we were hoping and working towards for was that people start to realize that uh, the marketplace and the app are the nicer way um, to book their own venue and to later on discover new venues. And uh, yeah, as you said, uh, also for us in the last uh, one, two years, we were able to shift uh, this from 10% from, uh, uh, Eversport channels to over 60% uh, in less than a year. So that worked out really nicely. And, um, and we didn't pay uh, B2C custom acquisition costs for that. So I think the number one asset we have is we don't have acquisition costs on the B2C side, but basically our venues did all the work for us. And uh, from, from my understanding of marketplaces, you always have to kind of match uh, uh, demand and supply. And once you have the supply side, you need to buy or try to get the um, demand side up. And this was something that happened pretty much all organically on, yeah. on, 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 on our model. And, and I think this is the number one beauty uh, of it. Yeah, I, I can just confirm what Hanno said, that uh, balancing that supply and demand side uh, is very tricky for marketplaces, especially at the very beginning. So by getting venues uh, pushing our app to their clients, we got 3 million app downloads and active users practically for free. Um, and at the same time, uh, it generates a very strong lock-in for them because once they got, once they pushed our app to all of their existing clients, if they wanted to switch to other provider, they would have to revert that action and tell everybody now, delete Booksy and download something else. And it would be um, a big hassle because it's hard to control hundreds of your clients and once they've downloaded the app, tell them to download something else, there is the transition period that is literally a mess. So um, that minimizes churn. Um, uh, Cost-wise, it's also very effective because typically marketplaces, they acquire supply side and the supply side never pays. Like this is just part of building the business and then you monetize on, on transacting between demand and supply. In our case, um, supply also pays us for using the software. So it's like um, virtually we are getting uh, the supply side for free. I mean, not. Uh, initially, because it takes like a few months to, to, to recover that money, but we are building supply side for free. The supply side gets demand side for free. So um, it's a very uh, effective model to build that marketplace and to solve chicken and egg problem from the very beginning. Yeah. And, and one thing I would like to add, um, it always depends which kind of marketplace you're running. But one thing we noticed is that um, I think in both of our industries, if you would run only a marketplace, um, and even if you get the venue to, to do the listing right, 
uh, listings change over time. So if you think of a, a sport venue and they offer classes, they have a class schedule. So usually if you copy that class schedule, you're fine. But you're only fine for the first three, four days. And then something changes. A teacher gets sick. Something changes in the schedule. And if they wouldn't use us as their software, the inventory starts to get worse and worse because the venue is not really caring about it. And we know from other companies that don't have the SaaS uh, backbone. And they have a team of four, five, six students that do nothing but trying to keep the inventory at a good quality level. And I think that's another big advantage that we don't touch the inventory because the venues are using us. And so the inventory is always up to date. And um, I think that's a big advantage, uh, especially if you have inventory that's um, changing over time. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And one thing that I would add, which we've seen is um, by taking the SaaS-enabled marketplace approach, you're often also able to uh, reduce marketplace leakage. So people going directly to the supplier and cutting out the platform. If you're also actually processing the bookings and become their main booking platform, they're less likely to kind of go around you and, and do the transaction off of the, the marketplace. Um, yeah, no, so it's really, really interesting. Uh, my. M my next question is, is about the business model and, and pricing of SaaS-enabled marketplaces. So looking at, especially at a lot of the um, US players like OpenTable that you mentioned and, and Zenefits, for instance, uh, a lot of them started off rolling out the software for free in order to acquire um, a, a lot of different suppliers. Uh, and then actually just charging for, for the marketplace. What do you think about these types of models and, and how are you thinking about pricing and, and the business model of, of your marketplace? Uh, funny that you mentioned it because that was the exact discussion we had yesterday uh, during our board meeting. So that's actually one of the uh, models we are now um, considering to speed up our growth. We, we've been growing pretty nice, three X year over year uh, in the past three years. Uh, but um, we are now considering to, to reduce pricing or, or give it away for free. It's always tricky because once you give something away for free, then it's difficult to get people to pay you for anything. Uh, and then collecting credit cards, once you have credit card on files, it's much easier um, to uh, enable other revenue streams. And this is actually how we've been now adding that marketplace um, or, um, revenue stream, because we already have uh, merchants' credit cards on file. It's easy to charge them uh, once we start generating leads and, and taking commissions. It's, it's seamless. They just opt in, and then we start bringing them new clients. So if it's for free and we don't have their credit card, then upsell to the marketplace would become a little bit more, more tricky. Uh, I guess it varies in different verticals, and everybody has to like test it, but that's definitely what one of um, intriguing models. Um, and that also depends on the ratio of, of that SaaS revenue stream versus marketplace revenue stream. In our case, we are estimating that long-term um, marketplace would generate 80 to 90% of revenue versus 10 to 20 from SaaS. Uh, right now, SaaS is dominant um, in our case, but it, it changes very quickly over time, especially in markets where we already have liquidity. So uh, given that the long-term value is in the marketplace revenue stream, that freemium model or free SaaS, that's absolutely tempting, and, and that's something we'll be uh, testing now. Um, yeah, we made quite an interesting experience quite early on in our uh, career uh, selling to tennis uh, clubs and um, at one point we also thought uh, why don't uh, let the tennis federation send out an email that we will give the booking tool for free and we thought that it would just explode because everyone knows that usually they would have to pay 80 euros a month and now they get it for free so we'll get hundreds of inbounds and then we just it's gonna grow crazy uh, what happened was that we got some 30, 40 requests, and those were the worst customers ever. Uh, it took a longer time to onboard them. Uh, the operations team had three times more work because they didn't show up prepared for the onboarding meeting, and we made a terrible experience with that um, and, and immediately stopped offering any deal like that. And I think, like just as we heard in the pricing workshop, um, if, if the price is zero, then some people might also think the value is zero or, or, or that there must be a hook or a trick or that they will monetize me later. And um, 
we found out that increasing the price and, in, and, and having a high implementation fee uh, brought us more revenue, more success in closing, and better onboarding experience. Um, and and it, didn't, it didn't slow us down in, in, in growth at that time. What we now think, looking in the future, is that if you have a fully well-working self-onboarding, that uh, a venue can really easily set up their whole infrastructure within our software, that we could try some kind of freemium model, um, that we say the first year is for free, or the first 10,000 euro transaction is for free, um, if they can do uh, a, a proper self-onboarding. But as long as there is manual work in onboarding them, and uh, and, and a lot of work for us to convince them over the phone that they even try it, then I think uh, a free model is, is um, not the right choice, at least for us. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, you talked about, I guess, some of these, these challenges in, in implementing um, these, the, the SaaS-enabled marketplace, uh, particularly around pricing. What would you say are you know, other key challenges you faced in terms of establishing this SaaS-enabled marketplace model? And are there cases in which you think maybe this model doesn't actually make sense for a particular business? It seems nowadays everyone wants to do a SaaS-enabled marketplace, but does it actually make sense all of the time? And what are the challenges when you actually build one out? Um, that I biggest challenge we faced was um, for at least a year or two we were trying to find ways to get the venues to promote our brand uh, and to be fine with us putting powered by Eversports in the widget and uh, them actually communicating in their welcome letter, hey we, we now start using the Eversports software, you can use the app and to structure the pricing and uh, the design of the app in a way that the, a venue communicates it, knowing that the competition is on the same app and on the same marketplace and under the same brand is a, a very tricky uh, thing to do for us where we, where we definitely didn't find the straight line but we were bouncing left and right until we find the right language, the right uh, design for the app. And um, the key takeaways we had from this uh, time was that, uh, that only very customer-centric work with the customers uh, was, the, was the key to success. And um, yeah, Stefan was working on this specifically, our, our CPO, talking to the customers and said, okay, how can we design the app in a way that you feel comfortable sending out our app link? And for, for, in our case, it was that we said, okay, if you invite someone, you are going to be on the home screen of the app. So if your customer downloads the Eversports app and he got invited by you, the first thing he sees is you and your venue. And if he clicks it, he sees your schedule and your pricing. And only if he actively presses another button and searches for something else, you, uh, he, he will do it. And, and then you can argue he would do it anyway. So you can't stop someone for looking for other services. And uh, that was our key to success in, in, in getting there. And it was definitely not, not an easy task to make it happen. I guess we were lucky and find that product market fit and, and were able to walk that thin line and keeping the balance to avoid that problem. But then when we started scaling up and hiring new people with marketplace experience from other verticals in different countries, the hardest thing was to keep that DNA uh, because they all um, were used to think like pure marketplaces. So uh, the, the, the biggest challenge when scaling that approach was to actually train people and to repeat over and over how we operate and what our values are because uh, for some reason people tend to forget. So uh, sometimes I was over repeating myself and, and just kept telling them over and over until, until they learned. And sometimes it takes months. So that was the biggest challenge we had when, when scaling that model. And, and so do you think you would recommend to most marketplace founders that they should take a similar approach to what you've taken and, and build a SaaS enabled piece? I guess. The most important factor is what, what Hannah and I uh, said, like if you need to have uh, real-time access to inventory, then this approach probably um, is the best one you can take. Mm -hmm. However, there are a lot of other marketplaces, a lot of other verticals where you don't need that. Like in food industry, like a restaurant can work with five or six marketplaces and if they get 
five orders at the same time, they can still handle it. They can bake five pizzas and, and ship them out with, with Uber Eats, with DoorDash and Slice. I guess with sports venues and with uh, beauty salons, uh, there can be only one calendar. So who controls the calendar will be able to bit build a marketplace on top of it. And no one else will be able to build that marketplace. So, so there are some specific verticals where this approach is a must. And both of you mentioned a little earlier on about how uh, this approach actually helped on the sales and distribution side because you didn't necessarily have to do as much acquisition in terms of the end consumer. Uh, could you talk a little bit further about you know how your sales and distribution strategies have changed since pivoting to, to SaaS-enabled marketplace? So... Um we were a marketplace for just a couple of months, and back then we had that customer first focus. So we were going after consumers, uh, kind of assuming that who owns the demand will control the supply. When we pivoted, we actually became merchant first. So we don't have a B2C uh, marketing team. Actually, we don't do anything when it comes to B2C. Like we acquired 3 million users, uh, but uh, we are not really focusing on them. I'm assuming that. Uh, um, we need to be merchant first and make merchants comfortable with us so they can push Booksy to their existing clients and when they do that at some point we'll build uh, liquidity and uh, that's how we distribute the app so our focus is on merchant acquisition and onboarding merchants so we have a pretty strong uh, customer service team because it's crucial that we onboard merchants and then we become the operating system that they literally run all of the operations uh, within our uh, SaaS product so it's not only a scheduling app but it's also inventory management point of sales um, um, CRM with marketing automation uh, business analytics uh, commissions for employees like literally everything because uh, we need to remove friction and need to become the operating system and that's when we know that we own the calendar and we, when we own it and they push it to the client, that's you know, how we generate those acquisition loops and um, then we just need to build scale and get that local liquidity. Um, <clears throat> you know, the sales over time changed for us in a way that um, at the beginning we were uh, basically when we came up with a studio solution for boutique studios we were just selling it everywhere we could through all channels we could sell it with so we had inbound marketing we had telesales we had inside sales and field sales and we were just shooting it out there and tried to get as many customers as possible through any channel that works and um, what changed over time was at one point we kind of forgot where, where we wanted to take this and we were so SaaS driven that we kind of forgot that we actually wanted to do something for people that are looking for sport activities. And when that shift started to get back on top of everyone's head that, that okay, we have done SaaS for a couple of years now, it's time to focus back on the, on the consumer side. Um, we realized that the sales approach is not the right one anymore and this is where some changes happened that we changed the bonus system for field sales that if they uh, close in certain verticals where we need more density they get a higher bonus so they were not just chasing the low-hanging fruits anywhere but they got a, a much bigger uh, bonus if they were uh, selling to mission critical venues in, 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 the, in the cities so we, we realized that uh, SaaS enabled marketplace has uh, or means that you have to master both games so you have to master SaaS and you have to master marketplace and we didn't we didn't do it for a long time and now that we really started to put more effort on the marketplace side and we try to get density and we work on the product and work uh, with a B testing in the app and try to see okay if somebody clicks to discover what kind of journey does he have where does he or she convert and start learning on this side, um, I think business starts to uh, get a lot better. And, and um, yeah, I think that, that the tricky thing is that you really have to, to master both games. And uh, that's definitely not, not easy if you're an early stage company. Yeah, makes sense. And um, just a, I guess, a more broad question. So in terms of both business models that you're pursuing, you have some already established um, peer models in other European countries as well as in the US. So, for example, with Booksy, you have Treatwell in, um, in the UK, and I'm not sure what the, the US version is called. 
um, and to a certain extent with what you're doing, you have class pass and mind and body. Um, have you guys taken any lessons from these peer models that are a little bit further down the line? And, and have you learned from any other SaaS enabled marketplaces? Well, actually, one of the lessons was at the very beginning when we realized that uh, something doesn't work with our pure marketplace approach. We analyzed other players. And one of the things we've learned is that to solve that issue with being a marketplace without owning the inventory, Treatwell had to follow up 70, up to 70% of appointments by phone, making sure that merchants actually put it into their calendars which mostly were paper calendars, and they, they had a huge operating team uh, taking care of it, not only four or five students, but like dozens of people doing it. So um, that was like one of the learnings that, uh, or one of the things that, that uh, confirmed that we cannot take approach because we wanted to build a scalable business and we could not afford hiring uh, dozens or poss possibly hundreds of people. So today we process millions of appointments and we literally don't have any conflicts. We, we don't have a single person on our team taking care of conflicts or double bookings because the way um, we incentivize merchants to work with our SaaS platform is that they take care of their calendar uh, because majority of the clients book with them through that calendar, so they need to make sure it's up to date. So it's like it takes care of itself. So that was one of the learnings. Another one uh, was from like pure uh, backend systems that they are not utilizing that network effect. So as Hanno said, like the learning was that we need to have DNA from both. So we need to have a strong SaaS platform. So they come for the tool, but also stay for, for the network, which means that we need to have millions of consumers using that because who, owns, uh, uh, who controls the demand will, will effectively also control the supply. Yeah. Well, for us, it was quite interesting when we realized that we have to build software uh, because otherwise the marketplace won't work. Uh, we didn't know that this is a model that already exists uh, because also at that time I, I would say we were quite unexperienced and it was actually 0.9 at that time uh, when we kind of pitched them during the tech stars that, the, that when, when we said we're not 100% sure if we are crazy or not that we tried to tackle both. He said, no, 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 you're fine. Uh, Open Table is a perfect example that this model can work and it's called SaaS enabled marketplace. I remember that time I was like, oh, that sounds fancy. Uh, so we are SaaS enabled marketplace then. And, um, yeah, and then obviously, since Open Table was mentioned, we looked at the company and how they did it, and I read about the founder and about their journey, and um, we, we read stories, especially about the lock-in, something you mentioned, that um, even though the software had quite a high price and they made lots of money with, uh, with generating leads for the restaurants, when another SaaS player came in the market and said, hey, use my SaaS for free, we even give you a big uh, iPad for free, they were using it for a couple of months and then they realized that they're losing so much business that they came back. And so I think this lock-in is super strong. This is when we, we, we switched there and ever since we are looking at, uh, at peers and uh, we're looking at Treatwell, we're looking at MindBody, um, we are uh, looking also at Booksy and some of the things we, we, we learned from you guys was um, how do you get offline customers to online customers? Because only with online customers you can make uh, payment revenue and only with online customers you can make uh, money in the marketplace at one point in the future. And then there were like little hacks that we learned that if somebody's uh, placing a, a, a call to one of the venues and then he gets a booking confirmation per SMS with a link to the app, that this is something that works super well. And it was not our idea. Uh, I'm not sure if, I think we got it from you guys and uh, it's working super well. And uh, yeah, we, you don't want to copy one, one by one, but obviously it's, it's, I think, a smart thing to do, to look at other uh, peers and see what works well for them, try it out. It doesn't mean that it has to work for you as well, but if it works, then iterate and, and make, it, make it fit for you. Yeah, makes sense. And great to hear that you guys are learning from each other. Um, I was thinking, how about we open up to the audience? Does anyone have any questions? Anyone? Thanks. I have a question about the sports-related marketplace. So you give them SaaS, and they can get bookings both from, from their SaaS and from the marketplace, right? 
Uh, do you get commission for bookings from SaaS, or do they pay you on a monthly basis? So uh, yeah, I think the pricing is key for, for, for it to, to work for our customers. And the way we did it was that they pay a regular SaaS fee. Uh, they pay for, for uh, payments, so if we uh, facilitate payments, no matter through which channel, uh, if it's a PayPal payment or a cre credit card payment, they are aware that this costs something and we have a, a cut there, so it's a, it's a quite a big revenue stream for us now. And what we do with the marketplace bookings is that we don't say only if somebody uses the Eversports app, you have to pay for it. What we do is that um, we know the customer base since they are using our software, so if a booking comes through our app, we check if that customer is already in their customer base. And if not, we ask him, have you been at that venue uh, in the last 12 months? And if he says no, we say, OK, look, we brought you a new customer through the app. And only then we charge. And I think this is the main key for the venues to promote us, because we tell them, look, if you promote us to your customer base, we guarantee you will never pay for it. Um, and, and I think this was a key driver for us uh, to make it work. And this is also what OpenTable does differently. I know that. But we knew that the, that, the, um, that the sport venue business has so much returning customers that there is no way they would ever communicate the Eversport app if we start charging them if somebody books through the app then. Yeah, but I was wondering if it's not taking you some clients away from the marketplace, right? If there is a huge venue that can uh, provide for a big uh, demand, then why should they use your marketplace? And I, from what I understand, you take more when people book through marketplace, right? Um, not 100% sure if I understood it, but I will give you an example. Um, we took over a yoga chain in Munich that had 20,000 customers in their customer base. And what they did when they started using us is that they sent an invitation to all those 20,000 customers that they can now book with our app. And that's where we see the main benefit that if those uh, people start to move to another city or they want to try another sport, then they will realize that they can use the app and the Discover in the app to book it with us. And so we don't monetize their own customer base, but we start making money once they start to use online payment and once they start to discover and use other venues. And the, the case you mentioned hasn't been something that we noticed that, that is bad for us. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Anyone building a SaaS-enabled marketplace that needs some advice on how to do it? Nope. OK. Um, I guess I'll ask another question. Um, one of the things I mentioned in the beginning was the fact that um, SaaS-enabled marketplaces, in theory, help you reduce marketplace liquidity. Have you had instance, um, not marketplace liquidity, marketplace leakage, so people actually trying to go off platform. Have you had instances where um, you've seen actually customers trying to go off platform and particularly the venues telling customers maybe to book off platform because it means that they will actually no longer have to pay you a commission? Uh, and if so, how did you go about tackling that issue and, and avoiding it? Um. We haven't. So we have had that uh, model that Hannah just described, that we never charge them for their repeat clients mm -hmm. to book with them again. So they don't have any incentive to poach um, their clients from our platform. And uh, they clearly see a benefit because, like, uh, not sure how that works for sport sports venues, but in, uh, in the beauty industry, like, people work with their hands. And when they work with their hands, they are not supposed to take those phone calls from their clients. So uh, they actually see that uh, by allowing their clients to book online, uh, they are not missing out on opportunity to get uh, clients booking with them. So uh, aligning the business model with their interest actually prevents that leakage. Um, yeah, for us, uh, it, it was only very rare cases that people take the effort um, to, as, I mean, the same argument is true for us. Uh, the venue has less work if the bookings happen online, uh, but we don't, we don't monetize only the first booking. We monetize uh, the first five bookings or the first 600 euros revenue where we charge something. So we have a cap on the money we make. But there were some corner cases where the venue was super smart and took the customer and uh, changed his email address and then uh, told him to book over the widget. So that same customer had one commission booking and then it was a, it was a, a widget booking that we didn't charge. 
but that were, at least from what we've seen in our database, these are very rare cases because we sometimes check if the name has double email addresses and if that was someone who was on the marketplace before. So there were only a couple uh, cases where we had to tell a venue if they continue doing that, uh, we're going to kick them off the marketplace and, um, and then usually the topic is off the table. Yeah, makes sense. And um, I guess another question is um, around retention. So one of the key metrics we look at, particularly when it comes to SaaS-based businesses, is actually ensuring that none of your customers are churning. Uh, how have you actually done about gone about making sure that you're retaining customers over the long run, both on the B2B side of things as well as on the end consumer side of things? Um, on the B2B on the B2B side, uh, I think it's just, I mean, we, we don't even have a, if somebody signs a contract with us, he can quit next month. So we don't even have a, a lock-in period for 12 months. And for us, it means we have to deliver the best experience possible. And what happens is that over time, a lot of data uh, gets collected and their customer base is there, their transaction history is there. So I think the longer a venue works with us, the less the likelihood that they will churn. And this is also what we see in the cohorts. And um, uh, yeah, the, if all transactions, all payments, all communication and uh, all new customers go through our channels, I think uh, churn is, 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 uh, is just uh, super low. And this is, this is the case. And on the B2C side, it's a different topic. I mean, you have to, you have to start working with, with B2C customers. And this is something we didn't do. Uh, for a long time, and only now we start to send mails uh, that if somebody uses his, did his first booking through Eversports, and then he doesn't book or she doesn't book again, that we send a reminder, hey, it would be great to see you again, or something like this. And this is something we started only a couple of weeks ago. We have not touched the B2C side uh, until now. So in our case, B2B and B2C retention is very correlated because merchants are the ones who push Booksy to their clients, then if they churn after a few weeks or a couple of months, then majority of their clients uh, churn with them because if the uh, stylist is not, the, not available in the app, people go back to booking them offline. Uh, so um, how to prevent that? Basically, what we've learned is that there are those two moments, aha moment and a habit moment. So basically, after they received a certain number of bookings, they realize like, wow, this shit works. And then they push it even more to their clients. And then when they get to that uh, habit moment, that's when we consider we habitualized it both for the merchant and for their clients, and they practically don't churn. So uh, all of our efforts right now are directed tower towards onboarding and um, increasing the speed of onboarding and pushing them through those aha and habit moments. Uh, and then um, what we see is that once we got a customer um, and Booksy is top of mind for them and they keep booking with the venue that has brought them to Booksy, but at some point they start uh, using Booksy as search and discovery platform to book other services, then even if the merchant um, uh, quits, then those consumers, they stay with us if, when they started booking with other uh, merchants. Yeah. So, so the, key, the key thing here is to um, improve the onboarding process and speed of that process. Makes sense. How, how much time do we have? Unfortunately, no. Okay, so we are out of time. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, really enjoyed the panel and thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>